Turn your Bibles to the, uh, to the book of Joel. Book of Joel. If you come to Calvary Chapel, you know that I, I am constantly making attempts at humor because I was always taught that humor is the highway to the heart. And um, I know that with a lot of the gloom and doom, and man, I, it's hard for me to watch the news anymore because, number one, we're not getting all the, the most accurate information. And two, the information that we're getting is just like, <laughs> so, to get rid of the din -din -din, I've got another quick song for you that, uh, that you're probably familiar with, but might tie in a little. You probably have never really listened to the words in the past, but if you listen to the words closely this time, you might see that it was slightly prophetic. So, let's go ahead and uh, hit that video. Base feet there. Get, you need a paint can. You got a paint can on you? <laughs> So anyway, staying inside, staying inside with us. Joel, chapter, uh, chapter 2. Father, we're grateful for the opportunity to be in your word together. And we're asking that you would bless this time. Would you anoint it? Would you give us ears to hear what you're speaking to us? Would you take a coal uh, off of your altar and touch my lips so I'm able to profess your truths and your word with uh, your unction and accuracy and an anointing that comes from only you. We ask this in, in the most holy, uh, the most revered name in the universe, Jesus. Amen. amen. Did you guys at home, did you say amen? Hey, everybody participates in, uh, in our home Bible study, right? right so I didn't hear you. Did you say am? Amen. You did? I did. Twice? Twice. Okay. All right. Okay. Putting you on the honor system. I didn't hear you. Check the recording later. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I did last time, and I was wrong. I was wrong when I thought I had given enough time at the end, and I, and I had it. Moving on. We're in the book of Joel. And in the book of Joel, God... Uh, describes a, uh, a time frame, a season in history that sounds crazy, sounds very difficult for us to actually believe. Now, I, I've heard a lot of crazy things in my life, like, uh, like a few years ago, a few years back, this owner of a reptile store gets upset at his employee, Okay. So what does he do? Does he, does, he, does he just yell at the guy and fire him? Nope. He starts hitting the guy, starts hitting the guy, an employer, hitting a guy with a particular object. You know what the object was? Did you hear about this? No. This is, you think I'm making it up? I'm not, I'm not making it up. There it is right there. He started 
batting the guy with a two foot long lizard. Bam! I mean, you know, this is a one tough lizard, but you thought your boss was on the crazy train. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, uh, this same owner, a few years earlier, he sponsored something else that sounds relatively crazy. It was, uh, it was an insect and cockroach, little cockroach eating contest. Can you imagine <laughs> eating, eating cockroaches? Well, that is, for some reason, that's what some people, people do. And so, so this one guy, he eats a dozen. He eats a dozen uh, of these little disease-ridden scavengers, wins the contest, and moments later, check it out, moments later, croaks off from choking on a little cockroach. And I, I don't know why you think that's funny. That's not cool. The guy's dead. That guy, it's it's kind of funny. I mean, what a way to go. Death by cockroach. That yeah. just, I mean, you know, that's the, you, how would you like that on your tombstone? Yeah, death by cockroach, right? How would you, well, how would you like to be the pastor doing that funeral? I couldn't have. All I know is that that story really bugs me. Get it? Get it? Get it? Bugs me? It's actually, come on, we're talking about the Bible here. Something else pretty crazy that happened. Uh, you know, I'm a San Diego guy, so when I hear crazy stuff happening in San Diego, it doesn't really um, bother me. So I'm reading about this, and it's in my old, my old stomping grounds in San Diego. It goes to a 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven is a convenience store for you for you people. They don't have any 7-Elevens here, right? You know what a 7-Eleven is? Yeah. All right, okay. They have them in Montana? No. No? Okay. But they have them other places that you visited? Yes. Like the rest of the world? Like San Diego. <laughs> like, like San Diego. Like San Diego has them. So he goes in this convenience, so the 7-Eleven, to rob it, to rob this 7-Eleven, uh, this which isn't an uncommon situation. What was uncommon is that he went in there dressed as Gumby. <laughs> Gumby, give me all your money. How would I <laughs> dress like? Here's his mugshot right here, right there. There's his, oh, yeah, there's, there's Gumby's, Gumby's <laughs> mug, mugshot. Got a little, a little input from the, uh, yeah, input from the peanut gallery, right? He's caught, he's arrested, he's thrown in jail, right? Now, how do you explain that situation to the other cons that are in there, right? What, what, what are you in there? What are you in here for? Uh... Trying to rob a, a convenience store. Yeah, yeah, but how'd you get dressed like? Well, I, I was dressed like that when I did it. <laughs> Probably even have the other cons moving away. Move, or getting beat up, beat up, something like that. Well, here's the deal. That situation landed him in the pokey for a long time. Get it, pokey? Gumby, pokey? No. Yes. I didn't say it was going to be a gem. Just be, <laughs> just keep, the, keep the thinking cap on. You people are wondering what's in here, right? It's throat coat. Take away with that. No, I don't trust it because you'll make some weird face. <laughs> I can trust Monica, right? Smell it? Okay. It smells pretty good. Yeah, it smells good, but it's just throat coat. There's nothing, <laughs> there's nothing uh, life enhancing in there, right? It's just, okay, moving right along. Here's the deal. We're talking about Israel in uh, this book of Joel. And Israel's behavior has landed them in an extremely bad situation that certainly could have been, could have been uh, stopped, but they didn't. And they, they, have, they have forced God to bring them as a nation to a major, major wake-up call. So in chapter 1, you'll remember this from, from last week, we saw that Israel had experienced a, a, a plague of locusts of biblical proportions, literally, Four different types, four types of locusts were listed, each doing a little mop-up on what the previous group of locusts uh, had left behind. And the land is stripped bare, there's, there's no fruit on the vine, there's no grain in the field, the locusts had destroyed their economy, does that sound familiar? Mm -hmm. Destroyed their commerce, their food supply, that's a safe way again today, shelves are minimal. I just for giggles walk down the paper goods aisle. No, not a roll of Charmin in sight. Not even the budget brand. Not even that toilet paper that's thin and you can still see the bark in it and all that kind of stuff. They don't even, they don't even have that stuff. Men, single men, spend money on 
quality. You just, you're wondering why the girls are staying away. If they, if they <laughs> finally, if it ever gets to the point where you invite them over for dinner, chaperoned, of course, by one of the elders of the church, um, and she happens to use your restroom and sees that bark-filled toilet paper, it's over. I'm telling you. So, Cottonelle, a little Charmin. That's, I'm just, that's a little heads up. That's a little free single person's uh, advice. Okay. So their food supply is limited. Their animals have been uh, taken out. This has forced the priest to be unable to provide uh, uh, grain and vine offerings in the temple. And it's causing them, it's causing all the spiritual leaders to mourn in sackcloth and... Uh, and ashes. It's just it's a very uncomfortable situation for everybody. And the, the Lord tells us that uh, this immediate event of him bringing a plague of locusts on Israel is a, is a precursor. That's what he's talking about. There's, there's, there's an actual, uh, there's, there's dual implications. There's one for what was going on in Joel's life 2,500 years ago. And for a future event that God is calling the day of the Lord, the day uh, of the Lord. And it's going to be, a, it's going to be an incredible time of, of devastation, uh, not just on Israel, but on the entirety, on the entirety of the planet. And it, it just, this COVID situation that we're going through now, we realize that something Something, some little thing can impact the planet basically overnight. So what happens when you start reading about the plagues in, uh, in Revelation 6 and this stuff that we're going through? Cakewalk. Okay, even the stuff that we're reading about, cakewalk, compared to what's going to be going on during the tribulation period. So this is why you need to be out there right now leading people to the Lord, because they're asking questions. I was at a prayer meeting this morning, and uh, one of my friends, another pastor in the city, who had been talking to his neighbor for years, his neighbor comes to him and asks him, said, I know that you've been witnessing to me for all this time, but I'm in a point in my life that I need some hope. And I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I mean, that's, the, that's, that's not just every pastor's dream. That's every Christian's dream that, you know, what must I do to be saved? And, and uh, so be out there telling everybody. I was at Safeway today, and I witnessed two of the people there. And people are open. People are listening. So don't waste this time. But even in all this, this doom and gloom, God is providing an opportunity for revival. He's giving an opportunity for, for revival through repentance. And you can never... It's one of the things that I learned very early on, and maybe, it, maybe I don't preach it enough here. Maybe some of the environments you've been in the past, but, but you cannot have revival without repentance. And you cannot have repentance without seriously looking at yourself. We have this... this habit of always looking at the speck, right, in somebody else's eyes mm -hmm. and forgetting about that big old planks, Louisville slugger that we have, that we have in, uh, in ours. And whenever you do some sober soul searching, uh, he's going to lead you to weep. He's going to lead you to sackcloth and, uh, and ashes. And it should be something that's happening regularly in your life. If depending on how well you're hearing the Lord's voice, because even though you might be doing relatively well, there's still sin in your life. Monica, there's still sin in my life. I know you're surprised by that. I know, I know, but there's still sin in my life. And obviously, <laughs> um, so <laughs> I love Ryan. Thanks for being up here tonight. Look at verse, uh, get me out of this, Ryan. Verse one, verse one, chapter two of the book of, uh, of Joel says, blow the trumpet in Zion and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. What's his holy mountain? What's that a reference to? What city? What city? What city? What city? There's a J, Jerusalem. ends in Jerusalem. Jerusalem. There, there you go. Very good. Jerusalem. Specifically where? 
Temple Mount, right? Temple Mount. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, for it is at hand. Five times. Five times in this book, this phrase, the day of the Lord, is, is declared. Three times in, uh, in just this, this chapter, this chapter 2. Three times the day of the Lord is mentioned concerning the timing in Joel. Uh, I think chapter 1, he says, it is at hand. Here in verse 1 of chapter 2, Joel has warned it's coming. In chapter 3, he says that it's near. The other two times it's mentioned, Joel is describing the ferocity of this period of time, saying it's great and very terrible. And at the end of this chapter, he says that it is great and awesome. Not like, dude, totally awesome. <laughs> but dude, like, awesome. You know, like it, it just, you are in awe, speechless of what is going to happen. So chapter 2 opens with Joel's exhortation to blow the trumpet, right? To blow the trumpet in Zion. So in those days, they didn't have uh, PA systems to get people's attentions, but they did have... Do, 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 do. There's actually a shofar right there. He had a, uh, a trumpet. When, when Joel mentions the blowing of the trumpet, he's probably talking about the blowing of a shofar. And, he, and uh, the one that's up here I picked up in, in Tiberias uh, last time I was there in, in Israel. Now, in this case, the shofar is being blown to warn the people that the day of the Lord is coming and that it's close at hand. And in... in Chapter 2, the prophet leaps over a great span of time to the end of days using this invasion of locusts as, as a picture of a great army that is going to come into the land of Israel in the last days. And, and the prophet is now describing the army that, that will attack Jerusalem at a point here in the future. And, and as they attack, the Lord sends his army to annihilate the attackers. And, and Joel ends this passage by using the term, the day of the Lord, for the third time. Now, one of the reasons we're to blow the trumpet is to warn people that the Lord is coming. Christians, uh, Christians have a responsibility to warn people. You know, I, the first, I read through Ezekiel 3, and verse 18, and I think chapter 30, uh, I mean, chapter 18 and chapter 33, three times. He says, if you do not warn the wicked man of his wicked ways, I'm going to hold you responsible. He says that, that wicked man will die, but I will hold you responsible for his blood. I, believe me, I don't know what that means, but I'm not going to find out. Every person that I can in my life, I am telling the gospel. I'm doing everything I can, and I, I just, this is not a time to, to be hiding the gospel to yourselves. This is the time where we need to be out more than ever looking for opportunities to, uh, to share the good news. I don't like to tell people to repent. Sometimes I have to. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes I have to, but I don't like it. You want to know why? Because people don't like to hear that they need to repent. And they think, well, who are you? You know, your life isn't perfect. Well, of course. But if you need to repent, it doesn't matter who says it. And it doesn't even matter what their motivation is. You need to do some soul searching and, uh, and repent of our sin. Um, because if we're not repenting of our sin, how, how can we be ready for the Lord's return? I ask people all the time, are you ready for the Lord to come back? And I know that they haven't repented of some of the pride that they've got going on in their life or some of their issues that they've got going on. And they, and they yeah, I'm ready. I go, no, you're not. No, you're not. And I, I believe me, as, 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 as I look at others, as my responsibility is, I'm looking at myself a lot deeper on my own life and saying, what do I, what do I need to, to be repenting uh, So repentance isn't a bad word. It can... You can't have salvation without repentance. So those great theologians from, uh, from the band, remember R.E.M.? Oh, yeah. Remember those guys? Remember that? The end of the world. Are right? singing with me? It's the end of the world. Yeah. 
as we know it. And then they go, I, I feel fine. What a stupid thing. It's the end of the world. But I feel fine. Pretty dumb, huh? I don't know what year that was written, but I bet you drugs were involved. So, you know, we're living in this era. It's a new normal right now. We have to admit it's a new normal. It's never going to go back to the way it was. You know, I love I love my brothers and sisters who have this great faith that says, you know, that, that we're going to go back better than before. And I go, well, appreciate that. But time will tell if you're actually right. Uh, I think that the only way that can happen is if the church repents. And I haven't seen the church repenting. I really have. I really, I mean, I haven't seen our church repent. I haven't seen the church as a, as a total having a repentant heart. You know, I, I was at this prayer meeting this morning, and, and, and as I was praying, I said, we need a lot less Psalm 91 and a lot more Psalm 51. And you guys probably don't even know what Psalm 91 is, but it's what, it's what everybody, you know, every Christian should know that. And, it, and it's not that I don't believe it. I do believe it. Psalm 91 is that no plague, no pestilence is going to come upon you, yada, yada, yada. And people are claiming that all the while. Christians have died from COVID-19. What does that say about their faith if they died? Does that mean that they... It's a principle, not a promise. It's a principle, not a promise. So I'm telling people, we need Psalm 51, because Psalm 51 is when David was repenting of his sin with Bathsheba. Lord, you will never despise a broken and contrite. Surely I was birthed in sin. And when we get to that point, that's, you know, he's... He's busted. He knows that he's, thou art the man. See, the, heart, the thing about David, that his, even though he was wrong and he had, been, he had blinded himself, when somebody who loved him came to him and said, thou art the man, thou art the man, he got it right there. The problem today is that most Christians don't get it. Thou art the man, thou art the woman. And we blow it off because we're not looking at our sin through God's. Guys, globally, everything has changed, and God has allowed everything that we have put our trust in to be stripped away in hopes of what? That we will see that all we need is, well, we need to repent, but all we need is Him. Sometimes, you know, all we don't need, we don't realize all we need is Him when He is all we have. I mean, my 401k, <laughs> right? <laughs> So I need to be talking to the elders and say, hey, you know, it's about time to give the guy a raise. Slightly overdue, but I ain't one to gossip, okay? Yeah. I'm, uh, I don't know if you've noticed this. Have you noticed I'm a relatively upbeat guy? Yeah. <laughs> Kill me. Killing me, Smalls. Kill I can trust you at home. You know that I'm a relatively up... Monica, I can always trust. Yes. I'm an upbeat guy. You know, for the, for the most part, I'm usually joy-filled, my, my glass half-full kind of guy. And yet, I am also at times called to be... There you go. This will be good for you. <laughs> right there. I am the Darth Vader of truth. The Darth Vader of truth when it comes to comparing the signs of the times to what the Bible says. And what the signs say, you know, I can tell you, the signs say right now, Jesus is coming. Woohoo! Jesus is coming! Woo! That's slightly better. That's good. That's good. But the signs also say that after Jesus comes for his church, guess who's coming after that? Antichrist. Antichrist is coming. The day of the Lord is coming. The tribulation is coming. And it will literally be hell on earth, a serious time of doom and gloom. Literally, look at verse 2. Talk about gloom. A, uh, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come, great and strong, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be uh, such after them, even for many successive generations. Look at verse 3. A fire, a fire devours before them, and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. Here we get another description of the utter destruction and the havoc from this plague of locusts, um, like the remnant of a severe 
fire. You know, I grew up in California. There, we had some severe fires. And when you would go up to the hills after that, you, well, you've seen it here. In the Black Hills, I mean, it's devastation. There's nothing alive. It was once green and lush like the Garden of Eden. And now it's like a, like a barren desert, like a completely barren desert. Now, in the middle of January, the U.S. Uh, economy, that bad boy was chugging along, <laughs> ready to hit... Uh, 30,000 points in the stock market, and now it has become a desolate wilderness. I'm speculating that it might even drop to 10,000 points. 50 million plus unemployed, mostly uh, applying for, uh, or most of them are applying for, for unemployment benefits. This is what happens when a land or a planet forces God to bring the fire of the Lord's judgment. Franklin Graham just saw him on a, just a regular commercial on Fox. It was a commercial on Fox. And he's, he's giving a short, in a, in a minute, he's giving a short version of the gospel and encouraging people to receive Christ. I was going, good for you. Good for you. Support uh, Franklin Graham and, and Samaritan's purse. But, uh, but Franklin Graham says that that this judgment that we're experiencing is a result of a world that has fallen. And it's not just that it's fallen. It chooses to be more and more fallen every day. Every day. Like I said, the world is not repenting of its sin. Now, speaking of testing the patience of God's judgment, do you know this? Do you know that several, several state capitals... Um, have allowed satanic rituals. Check that bad boy out. Satanic rituals in their capitals. In their cap- I, I just it, none of that. That just it. It makes no sense to me. That why why don't we just say no? Why can't we just say no? No Satanists allowed, right? No witchcraft allowed. I mean, it's, God doesn't get thrilled by that kind of, somebody's got to make a stand, make a stand. Uh, is, you know, this one, this particular one is a state capital in Washington, Washington state. And just want you to think this through. What is one of the hot spots for the COVID outbreak? Washington. Washington. And the other hot spots are New York, New York, New York City. New York City, and the high population areas in California. What do all three of those have in common? Turn their back. Totally turn. Totally turn their backs on God. So um, look at verse 4. Look at verse 4. Joel chapter 2. Their appearance, their appearance is like the appearance of horses and like swift steeds. So they run with noise like chariots over mountaintops. They leap like a noise of the flaming fire that devours the stubble like a strong people set in battle array. Notice how many times Joel uses the word like, like to describe this army of uh, mutant ninja locusts at best. You know, and and he's talking about this, this swarm of billions of locusts. And, and it's as loud as an army of, of chariots and horses and, and like a loud crackle of a, of a fire. Look at verse 6. Before them, the people writhe in pain. All faces are drained of color. All faces are drained of color. When, when people's faces grow pale like that, that means they're what? In terror or in, or in fear which describes how many people are today due to the coronavirus. Even, even if there is need to panic, the way we have panicked is still illogical. It still amazes me that the first items on the shelf to empty were not the food shelves, but what? Toilet. The toilet paper shelves. I'm thinking like, what? what? I still think it, it's those Sherman Bears. There, I'm, still think, I'm still thinking it's the publicist for the Charmin Bears to be able to get people out there, you know. Explain that one to, you know. Now, little Johnny, we, 
we, we don't have any more food in the house, <laughs> but let's be grateful we have plenty of Charmin. Right? How do you, how do you explain that? The priorities are messed up there. Food in your child's stomach is, uh, is more important than paper for his hiney. I'm just saying if you have to choose one or the other. Hopefully you don't have to choose. You know what I'm saying? This, sorry for any p- picture. I just painted one there and I almost went there and I didn't say it. <laughs> Thank you, Lord, on my tongue. All I can tell you is this, is that the devil is a very good liar. Toilet paper, food. Toilet paper, food. Hmm. Look at verse 7. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation and they do not break ranks. They do not push Uh, one another. Everyone marches in his own column. Though they lunge between the weapons, they are not cut down. Look at verse 9. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb into the houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and the moon grow dark and the stars diminish their brightness. You know, these armies of of, uh, of insects, they, they just couldn't. They just couldn't be stopped. Walls didn't stop them. They climbed through. You were a thief growing up, right? I was a thief. You never, you never climbed through a window? No. To steal anything? I climbed, I climbed through no. a church window. That's how mad I mean. You know, I know. What's the statute of limitations? It doesn't matter. I've been forgiven. It's all under the blood. But really? Really? Maybe to get out of the house, but not... In the oh, yeah. It's <laughs> always, remember how I always said you got to draw the truth out of people? I know it's always, it's always, well, he said in a window, not out of a window, so I'm, I'm off. Okay. I get what you're going with that. You know, um, there's little thieves, you know, there, there are so many of them that they, they, they block, they block the sun uh, and the moon and the stars. That's a lot of locust. You know, we again get a description of their their counterparts in the, in the book of Revelation. We talked about this in week one and in Revelation chapter nine. Remember that? I showed you that, that, that little video where John tells us that, uh, that out of the bottomless pit, demonic locust will be released. It says this, look at, I think you can see it. I think you can read it from there. Yep. It says, uh, and they were not given authority to kill men, but to torment them for how many months? Five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will what? Flee from them. These little creatures are ultimately under the authority of who? The Lord. Well, they're under the Lord because he, God won't allow them. He just says, can't kill them, but you can torment them for five months. Even though they want to die, they'll be in so much pain that they'll want to die. But notice there, uh, I probably should have had you turn there. Well, actually, turn there. Revelation chapter 9. Don't you say revelations. <laughs> Don't do it. Don't do it. I knew, I knew it. I saw that little bubble. I saw that little bubble up here. He was going to mess with me. Because it's not revelations, it's the book of Revelation. Hmm. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ, the unveiling, the apocalypse. That's what it means. Look at, uh, look at verse 7. It's a nasty looking little guy right there. Hi. Big, sharp fangs. Okay. The shape of the locusts was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like, there it is again, like gold. And their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair. And their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates like breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months, and they had a king over them, the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek, his name is Apollyon. You know, it's been said, you ever seen scorpions? They're mean, they're just like nasty. You know, looking just, you know, yeah. something like that. <laughs> one of the most painful attacks. Did you get that? 
<laughs> didn't look as intimidating when I did it, huh? It's because I can't put them, I can only do those. I can't do the ones that are really, I could do a dog puppet or something. Or, anyway, um, I went there. I just, I'm, I'm back. I came back. I came back. But uh, it's one of the most painful things that a person can experience. Um, but in adults, it's usually not, it's usually not fatal. The scorpion stabs its victim, and then when it's got its victim, <laughs> it puts that, that yeah, doesn't look like it hurt much. <laughs> <laughs> Work with me. <laughs> that's, that's better. <laughs> that, that, no, it's a good attempt. So anyway, stabs him. Uh, venom runs through the veins, and the nervous system seems like it's on fire. The target area will often turn black and blue and send the individual into convulsions with excruciating distress. And the poisons, you see that, put that in your hand? No, thank you. No, thank you. The poison's effects usually lasts less than a week. But in this case, the pain is going to last how long? Five months. Five months. Five months. Recipients of those attacks will probably even attempt suicide, but death has taken a five-month holiday. And even if people put a bullet in their brain or, or hack off the area that is stung, they're not going to die. They cannot die. And the additional injury will only add to their misery. Do you understand why I say that you don't want anybody to be there to go through this tribulation period? You know, it's also very likely that this situation will cause many to lose their minds, to go insane in the membrane, right? And, uh, and begging, begging to die. It's going to be a time when, uh, when the living will envy the dead. The living will envy the dead. Now, I read through that. So I don't like reading through that kind of stuff. But I ask myself, is God sadistic? You know, why does he allow these people to go through this kind of pain for five months? And I think that the stings and the pain of these demonic hordes may lead them unto what? Repentance, mm -hmm. right? Repentance as they see those who have repented are not affected by the locust. It seems like a terrible way to have to get someone's attention to turn to God. But remember what Jesus said. He says this in, uh, in Matthew. Matthew 10, verse 28, it says, do not fear those who kill the body who cannot kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell, right? And again, we see one more reason to give just great effort into winning people to Christ now so they don't have to endure those kinds of intense sufferings then. Verse 11, Joel chapter 2. Verse 11, the Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For strong is the one who executes his word. There it is. For the day of the Lord, probably want to underline that, right? For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. You know, if you're reading uh, out of an NIV, I think it says um, dreadful. And the KJV, you know, it says awesome. And then it says who can endure it? Who can endure the day of the Lord? God gives similar warning through the prophet Malachi in chapter uh, 3, verse 2. And the Lord, we can't miss this. The Lord is taking credit here for this being his doing. His doing. And this plague is his army of judgment. When the, when the Lord is saying something is great and terrible, guess what? It's greater and terrible-er, terrible-er, right? Er, than anything that we can imagine. And the Lord switches gears here from the present calamity to a future calamity in the actual day of the Lord. And, and as the, the locust devastated Israel, the judgment, the judgment that comes in the tribulation is going to, to devastate the entirety of, of the world, of the the world. You know, the events deal here directly, what we're reading here in our Bibles, directly with Israel. But the principle and the implications and warnings and, and, and promises are for all believers, which, which leads us to some of the, 
most well-known and, uh, and most preached verses in, uh, in all the scriptures. Look at verse 12. Joel chapter 2, verse 12. It says, Now therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with how much of your heart? All, all of your heart. All of your heart. Now, before we go any further, I, I just need to underline that, that three-letter word. Did you do that? Underline it or circle it or highlight it? All. That three-letter word, all. God says, turn to him with how much of our heart? All. all of our heart. All of our heart. That's his standard. That's his standard. He wants and expects all of us. All. Not all of us, but all of us. All of, make the motion, all of us. Very good. Okay, very good. Yeah, very, yeah. There you go. All of us. That's all, that'll work. That works. That works. But how often does he want all of us? All the time. All the time, right? 24-7. All of the time. You know, I've been a Christian for 31 years now, which is uh, a relatively short time compared to some of the Bible teachers that, uh, that I look up to. But even in my three decades of observing the body of Christ in many arenas, the gospel of salvation has, has been blurred at best and watered down at worst. And that watering down has removed words like all. We're to love the Lord with what? All our heart, all our mind, all our soul, all our strength. That pretty much covers... All, everything, everything. But we've, we've removed that from the expectations that God requires. All. Because all means all, and that's all, that's all all means, right? All has been removed. Sin has been removed. Hell has been removed. Um, Die to self has been removed from the proclamation of the modern God. Be holy is... I am holy has been removed from that and, and, and it's been replaced with a very worldly definition of grace. I mean, I, I, none of us could stand without God's grace. But, but grace is just one attribute of the king of the universe, not the only attribute. And sometimes this, this new definition of grace gives a, a license to sin. Gives a license to sin and still claim to know the God who says, do not sin. Says, do not sin. Now, we were going through 1 John, so we know that the man who claims that he has no sin is what? Or is an L ends in ire. Liar. Liar. He's a liar, right? He's a, he's a liar. But we should, we should certainly never feel comfortable in our sin. Look at, uh, look at that verse again. Turn to me with all your heart. With fasting, with, uh, and this is God's definition of what it means. Because everybody says, ah, yeah, I've turned to him with all my heart. Well, is this what you're doing? Because this is God's definition. If you're not doing this, then, then whatever your definition, it doesn't matter. With fasting and with weeping and with mourning. That's what I say, you know. Uh, spend time in the Word, journal, and as you're journaling, you're going to find out that, man, there is buku sin in my heart, and I want to hate it the way God hates it. Turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, and with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he's gracious, right? And he's merciful, and he's slow to anger. I'm waiting for an amen or something yeah. like that. Amen. And of great, uh, of great kindness, and he relents from doing harm. Verse 14, who knows if he will turn and relent? And leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. What an unbelievably patient God we serve, who is gracious and merciful and slow to anger and willing to relent from his chastening of us if we would just be honest with him about our sin. If we would just be honest with him about our sin. My early days as a as a baby believer in, uh, in the Lord, uh, I remember that uh, 
that uh, he just said, the music that you're listening to needs to go. So you've probably heard that story where I took a sledgehammer to all my cassettes. That's what they had back then. <laughs> and cassettes and eight tracks. And I took, uh, I took a sledgehammer you know, to all my ACDC tapes and Crocus and, and Judas Priest and Black <laughs> Sabbath and Iron Maiden and Scorpions and all, the, you know, all of those bands. And, and I've been a rock and roll fan for years. I, you know, I, I still am. But as, I, uh, but as a new believer, the Lord used um, a very sappy, a very Christian-y ballad. Uh, and I, I hate, I still don't, I'm still not super fond of ballads. Um, but they used a sappy ballad to get me to understand that he wants, you know, he wants all. He wants all of me. And it was a song that was, it was just centered on his kindness leading us to repentance. You know, that's out of Romans 2. And it was a song by Leslie Phillips. Do you remember her? Anybody? Yeah. Leslie, Leslie Phillips. Um, now, it didn't, it didn't hurt that I had a crush on her, like, <laughs> like most other guys. I mean, she's a hottie back then, you know? No? I don't know. Good to me back then. So, uh, so it didn't help, uh, it didn't hurt that I had a crush on her, but the Lord used that song to really let me know I mean, you think that I have pride now? <laughs> I know the answer to that, and I do, and I hate my pride. And I hate my pride. Don't give me that pious look, because I know that I've seen it. You know, I'm just saying, don't just be careful where you're looking, because you might hit me with that two by four. It's in your own eye, right? You know, but, uh, but use it just to, just to crush the sin out of me, crush the pride out of me, and, and it deepened my crush on him. Deep in my love for him. So I have a, I have a two-minute segment of this that I want to play for you. I think you've heard it before. Be a good song. Be a good song for us to do. No excuse, no one to blame, nowhere to hide. The eyes of God have found my failures, found my pain. My weaknesses and knows my shame, but his heart never leaves me. It's your kindness that leads us to repentance, oh Lord. Knowing that you love us no matter what we do makes us want to love. Those words there, no excuse, no one to blame, nowhere to hide. The eyes of God have seen my failures, have seen my pain. You know, he understands my weaknesses. You know, he understands my frailties. And uh, when I'm honest with the Lord, he just, the, the only times that I feel distant from the Lord is when I'm fighting against him, when he's busted me on my sin, you know? And, you know, he, he, he understands my frailties and my weaknesses, and, and he's, he's certainly not surprised by my sin. But what he is surprised by is when I pretend that he doesn't see my sin. 
and that I don't have a need to repent to Him uh, or to others that I've biblically injured. You know, there's, a, there's, there's one thing to get right with Him because ultimately all of our sin is against Him. But if you've biblically injured other people and you haven't gone to those people, and there's, there's, a, there's a missing part of that. Now, now I, I think you've heard someone else sing the song. It was actually the, uh, the Apostle Paul. He declares it in Romans 2, right? Verse 4, do you show contempt for the riches of his kindness, tolerance, and patience, not realizing that God's kindness leads us what? To repentance. Towards repentance. And, and let me just ask the people at home, because I'm sure the people here at my house are, uh, are perfect on this, but, but have you taken ownership of the fact that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. It's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Now, I know, I know. Talked about it earlier. You, you think I never sin. You think I never. I never make mistakes. And it's obvious why you could think that, right? <laughs> Good for you. Good for you. But spoiler alert, I can be just as troublesome to, uh, to my Heavenly Father, to our Heavenly Father, as I know that some of you have been. <laughs> as, you know, we, we can all be that. You know, just in what we're reading about now, Israel has forced God, has forced God to bring correction to them by this plague of, uh, of locusts. And God's hand of prosperity had been on Israel. And then they drifted into what? Complacency and, uh, and unthankfulness. And they, they slid towards idolatry and drinking and apathy towards the things of God. And God wants, God wants our attention. I woke some people up out there. He wants, he wants our attention. He wants all of our attention. And he deserves all of our attention, all our loving attention. And if we don't give it to him volitionally, he's going to bring what? A wake-up call into our life until he, until he gets it. And that's what's happening here. The children of Israel had, had forced God to chasten them. Now, how does this chastening message apply to us in our, in our current event? You know, this... Corona, COVID, chaos, and confusion that's going on. You know, it's, it's the question, you know, that many are asking. Is this pandemic that, I don't even really think it's a pandemic, if you go by, by what the actual definition of pandemic is. Maybe I'll get to that one of these weeks. Is this actually a pandemic, a, a, a judgment from God? And many pastors say yes. You know, what do you think? We talked about it uh, last week or the week before, I can't remember, 44% of Americans say yes, that, uh, that this is a wake-up call from God. Surprise, surprise, when pastors report honestly on the condition of our nation and the world with its, uh, with its promotion of uh, homosexuality and uh, idolatry and even environmentalism, that's worshiping the created thing over, over the Creator. You know, the people actually wanting communist rule, you know, in our, in, in our, in our world. Uh, that creates havoc on, on precious people that God loves. And that's, that's why he doesn't like those things. So it's obvious God cannot be happy. And in hopes of turning his people back to him, as is his method, he sends a wake-up call, right? A wake-up call. A wake-up call. Wake up! What if I said that really? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's good. Yeah, a little delayed there, but, but you get it. A wake-up call. Interesting that this pastor, uh, this pastor right here, Ralph Drollinger, um, who teaches Bible studies at, uh, at the White House, he's a guy that I went to school with back, uh, back in the day, back in the 70s at, at Glorious Grossmont High School in La Mesa, California, right? And... Uh, I, I, I hope that, that we realize this, that at times, God will test us. And what we have to do is realize that God has every right. Doesn't he have every right? 
to test us. He has every right to test us. And he tests us ultimately for our own good. In Revelation 2, Jesus wrote a letter, a report card, to seven churches in Asia Minor, including one to the church in Ephesus, a church that was doing a lot of things well, a lot of things well. They were laboring in the gospel. They were enduring persecution. They weren't putting up with evil, and they were testing the false prophets and, and proving them liars. But then Jesus went on to say this. Check this out. In verse 5, Revelation chapter 2, verse 5, he says, Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen. Repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you and quickly remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent, repent right? I understand our carnal nature is not wanting to accept responsibility. But as believers, knowing the conviction of the Holy Spirit, it doesn't make any sense to not be honest with God and to not be honest with others. You remember Jimmy Hoffa? Remember Jimmy Hoffa? Jimmy Hoffa. Mobster, cement shoe kind of guy, you know. Uh, they got popped, jury tampering and fraud, bribery, and then he... Disappeared, remember that? Disappeared in 1975, presumed to have died from wearing a pair of what? Cement shoes, yeah, (laughs) cement shoes, right? Concrete shoes, and then uh, given a little swim in Lake Michigan or somewhere, right? Well, before his demise, he had many colorful quotes, and this was, uh, this was, this was one of, this is one of his quotes. He he says, I have many faults, but being wrong ain't one of them. You know, has anyone uh, seen Jimmy Hoffa recently? Uh, negatory, right? Negatory. Christians can't have Jimmy Hoffa syndrome. You know, I, I may have faults. <laughs> you know, being wrong is not one. Is one. You know, we, need to, we just need to learn the freedom of confessing and repenting and, and forsaking uh, our sin. Wind it down for, uh, for tonight. Repentance. I, I hope you've written that word down. <laughs> a few times tonight. Repentance is an actual change of heart. Change of heart that leads to a change of behavior. Repent isn't a word that we should shy away from. Repent is a word that, that uh, uh, we should actually embrace. We should actually embrace it because we will always find acceptance at the mercy seat when we embrace repentance, when we humble ourselves before him, when we admit and confess and forsake our sin. You know, the burden immediately comes off our shoulder. I, I, I can tell if you have the gift of discernment, you can, just, you, you, you can see when people are walking around with the weight of sin on their shoulders. You can, you can physically see it. Sometimes you can see it. You can see it spiritually. But, but when you're repenting your sin, the shackles are loosed. You're, you're, you're set free, right? And we're restored in the right fellowship with God. Great awakenings are a result of repentance resulting in great revival. In, uh, in chapter 7 of Second Chronicles, Solomon is visited by the Lord. And he is, he is given the antidote to, uh, to judgment. Let's read this together as we're wrapping up for tonight. Can you see that? Right there? Can all of you see that at home? Probably can, because you've got it on the big screen right there. Can you guys all see that? Mm-hmm. Yep. Let's read it together. One, two, three. Go ahead. When I, I shut, shut up heaven, heaven and there is no, no rain, rain, or rain, command the locusts locust to devour, devour the land. land. Hmm. Here it is. And sent pestilence among my, my people. people. Yeah, here it is. It my people, people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will turn from heaven and I will what? Forgive their sin and heal their land. You know, the reason, the reason people are not quick to repent is because we don't look at our sin the way God looks at it. I mean, I want to be very sensitive to sin. You know, I, I, I actually would, every time I sin, I'd like to weep. I, I, just whatever it takes, Lord, so that I see sin the way that you see, because we force him. I think we force him to weep, because he knows that we don't have to. And if we force him to weep when, when we 
when we just let it go for a, a day or for a week or for a month or we can hold on to sin for years. And we can expect, we keep going through the motions and praying and God's, I sure said in my heart, right? I would have not heard your prayers. Um, we need to look at the, the side of God that, we have a tendency to do this. We look at the side of God that extends grace and mercy and compassion, kindness, and long-suffering, and yet we neglect God's holiness and righteousness and purity. And uh, the Bible says that Jesus is the spotless lamb, spotless lamb. And my heart grieves when I sin. But being honest with you and everybody watching on Facebook and and the YouTube channel and watch this later on, is that, is that I know that my sin grieves God. But does it grieve me enough to change? You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about? Does it grieve me enough? Does it grieve me enough to change? That's where a personal call to repentance comes in. And repentance is what Joel is seeing is, is necessary for the people of his day. And that's what God sees is necessary for the people, especially his people, today. A wake-up call from the Lord often includes a call to repentance. And this Second Chronicles 7 passage is, is perfect. If, if my people who are called by my name will turn from their wicked ways, then our Father will hear from heaven and, uh, and heal our land. Father, we just thank you so much for everything that you do for us and everything you provide, Lord. We thank you for this study in Joel tonight. And we just ask, Father, that you help us to choose faith over fear. Yeah. Today we have learned that, um, that we need to do that, Lord. That in this crazy time of corona, that we need to turn to you. That we should not be worrying about what the world is saying, Lord, but to trust everything that your word says. And we want to do that tonight, Lord. Help us to choose faith over fear. Father, we do thank you for allowing this time to come in this scary, potentially scary time, Lord, to sit at your feet and get refreshed. Father, we do not fear because we have you in our life. Father, we thank you so much for this wake-up call that this coronavirus might be, Lord, that it just gives us a chance to look at our own lives and see where we need to get rid of the sin in our own life so we can be totally clean and be our pure Lord to fall after you in all things. So Father, we do thank you for the study. Thank you for the words that Greg, you gave Greg earlier today to share what's on his heart, sharing from you, Lord. Oh Lord, it is so evident on how much you love us with your grace. Yeah. You give us new mercies every day and oh Lord, you know we need them. <laughs> but I pray that you would just search each and every one of our hearts. And if there is sin that we have in there, Lord, I pray that you would just show us and give us the strength to overcome it. Because with you, we can do all things, Lord. So I pray that we just have the spring cleaning in our heart and just take away the sin and fill them with the goodness of you, Lord. Heavenly Father, I just come up for you and I just thank you for this time we've had together here tonight to dig into your word and to study. And Lord God, what stuck out to me is repentance and boldness. Give us a heart for repentance so that we can speak boldly and speak your words to those around us that need to hear your voice right now. Lord, we have we took you off the mantle, Lord. We've replaced you with idols of wood, hay, and stubble, just stuff that is going to burn and uh, just help us to get our focus. We need to uh, put you back in the place where you belong, Lord, and that is our number one priority. And uh, just help us to help this nation to uh, fall on our face before you and repent, just as Second Chronicles says, Lord. Lord, uh, it's your kindness that leads us uh, to repentance and we're we're humbled that you are so long-suffering 
uh, with this. God, we, we love you, and we want to uh, be a blessing to you. So would you help your church just to get right with you? We're, we're, we're desiring uh, relief. We're desiring revival. But God, remind us that that starts with repentance. So let every person in the body of Christ, those who are uh, watching tonight, uh, those that are here, those in every church in the nation, God, I pray that we would just, just let your Holy Spirit fall on, on your children and, and, and uh, help us to, to just strip the pride away and not think that we have to try and keep anything hidden from you. Help us to bear our soul and uh, allow you to uh, replace beauty for ashes. You can do that. Your anger lasts only a moment when we're broken and contrite before you. In your name, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.